Hey, uh, welcome. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here. And sincerely, welcome to Heritage Christian Fellowship. Welcome to the year 2023. I want to welcome those of you that are here. we got people out in the overflow. And I know like we do each week, we've got people that are tuning in online. We're grateful to be able to gather here on the first day of a new year. We've been in a series here at Heritage uh, it, looking at the book of Hebrews. And so if you brought a Bible today, I'd encourage you to open up to Hebrews chapter 3. Last uh, couple of weeks, I wasn't able to be here with you. I ended up spending some time in Wisconsin, some sweet time with my family. Very grateful, but I, I hated missing the 18th, and, and I really did not like missing Christmas Eve with y'all, but we were able to tune in online and participate. It feels great to be back with you. I miss this church, and I miss our valley, and I'm really grateful to be back. It's, it's a bizarre thing. We've lived here a little over two years, and as we were coming in, it's like, you're not feeling, of, you feel like you're a guest somewhere for a while when you move there. And there's that first visit back where it feels like home. Like this was, I think, our first, my first visit coming back to the Rogue Valley where it felt like home. And coming here today with my faith family, it feels like home. So I'm grateful. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, I, I pray, Lord, that as we open up your word today, God, as we study uh, and continue our study here in the book of Hebrews, Lord, would you meet us in this place today? God, God your, your spirit, God, it needs to open some eyes and soften some hearts today, God. We need to hear from you. Loosen up our ears, God. We want to we hear from you through the preaching of your word. And so, Lord, would you enable us? Would you, would you help us today as we study this text? God, would you help us to hear the things you want us to hear? And God, would you help us to respond to the things you want us to respond to? God, get uh, uh, me as a human flawed communicator out of the way, Lord. And our prayer is that we can simply encounter you through the faithful handling of your word. Meet us in this place. We ask these things in Jesus' Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my sermon today is Encourage One Another. There's going to be three simple points. I know there's going to be some points on the screen. Feel free to take a photograph of those if you want, or you can take them in your digital notes. I'll, I'll end up working through those points a little bit later in the sermon. But the reason I'm calling the sermon today uh, Encourage One Another is that's exactly what our passage is about. That's the emphasis of the text we're going to be in, in in Hebrews 3, verses 13 through 19. Now this, this word, it's actually the word exhort in our text. It's not a passive encouragement that the author is calling us to. It's not a passive attaboy or a, or a simple pat on the back or a you go girl or a, or a like uh, on social media. This is a deeply relational call to exhortation that we're going to read about and study today. It's to commit to helping one another stay focused on what's important in the face of fierce forces that seek to cause believers to fail. What I'll come back to again and again in my teaching today is is simply the one point of the sermon, and this is it. Never stop encouraging one another. Never stop exhorting one another to confidently hold fast to Jesus. That's what I think the text is telling us to do today. And since this is God's living word, it's what God is calling us to consider today. We'll unpack that as we move through this teaching. As I thought about this this image of exhortation or encouragement, it reminded me of coaching. I've been around athletics for over 40 years. Uh, When I was uh, six years old, I started playing t-ball, and I had like one eye that didn't quite work right, and I tried to play t-ball. I got into Little League, couldn't hit the ball, and I knew it was my time to hang up the bat when I won the Most Hardest Trier Award when I was in sixth grade. The actual award was, I got an award for exceptional enthusiasm, which was like, at the time I thought it was awesome. Looking back on it now, it's like, hey, wait a second. (laughs) That's not, but I started playing t-ball when I was six, all through middle school, high school, and into college, played sports. Uh, My wife, similarly, uh, we played sports up until our early 20s, all the way through college. And then after college, we got involved in, in coaching. And my wife and I both, my wife more than me, but we've coached football and basketball and volleyball and wrestling and track and field and powerlifting for years. My wife still coaches. She just spent the last four days in San Francisco with the North Medford girls basketball team at a basketball tournament. And so we love coaching, been around it forever. And, uh, and then now as parents, we've been about watching other coaches for 12 years as our kids do sports, middle school, high school, into college. And, and so we've been around coaching. So I've been thinking about coaching and, and, the, and the call of coaches to exhort or to encourage the athletes that, they, that, they're, that they're called to coach. I, I, I've had good coaches and bad coaches in my life. I'm sure if you've been an athlete, you've experienced similar. I think to my years as a coach, I've been a good coach and I've been a bad coach. And certainly as a parent, I've watched my kids be coached by good coaches 
and bad coaches. And I think there's a lot of reasons why someone might be a good coach and might someone be a bad coach. But I think most fundamentally, a bad coach is someone who's in it for themselves. And a good coach is someone who's in it for the sake of the athletes. And I think there's a, there's a downhill, there's a trickle-down effect if you're in it for yourself. A bad coach will see athletes as a means to their own end, and they'll use athletes to climb a ladder. And that's damaging. And a good coach will, will be concerned chiefly uh, with the end result of the athlete as a person. And they'll see the blessing of being involved in the life of the athlete as a means by which to care for the person. When I think of the best coaches in my life and the best coaches that I've witnessed, they, they, they want to see the best from the athletes they coach. They don't just focus on wins and losses, but they focus on the long-term development of the human being that they're coaching. They're not so much concerned with championships, but with character. Ironically, for those of you that have been around athletes for any length of time, it's the coaches that focus on character that tend to find the championships, isn't it? So that means that the best coaches can take time to get to know their athletes. They they know what it takes to help them grow. Each athlete's different. And you've probably, if you've been around sports or even, even extracurriculars that involve coaches, the best coaches know who their athletes are or who their pupils are. And they learn how with each unique athlete, how, how to lean in and help that particular athlete, athlete with the fundamentals. They, they know how to guide them through a slump. They know how to, to lead these athletes to begin believing in themselves and, and to learn to, to rely on their teammates. And, and in so doing, they're not just developing athletes, they're developing human beings in ways that reach far beyond the athletic arena. They know those who they coach, and they know when it's appropriate to raise the voice and when it's appropriate to be quiet. These coaches know when to praise the athlete or when to rebuke the athlete. They know what skills or techniques need to be developed. They know what needs to be left alone. So you've been around these coaches. You've seen these sorts of people in life. These are the people who know that sometimes an athlete needs a kick in the pants, and sometimes they need an arm on the shoulder. Sometimes an athlete needs uh, to face some discipline, and sometimes an athlete needs to experience a little bit of grace, depending on the moment, depending on the person. Sometimes an athlete needs an encouraging word. Sometimes they need a rebuke. Sometimes they need a a break to calm down. Sometimes you need to keep them engaged in the game and teach them how to work through their emotions. All of this as a coach who's got their chief end is the improvement of the athlete. All of it is a form of exhortation. It all depends on the coach knowing their athletes. It's deeply relational. They have to know how to walk alongside these men and women. I think the best coaches are exhorters. They're encouragers. And my guess is if you were to talk about your life growing up, if you ever did sports, t-ball, or whatever, my guess would be that you don't remember so much the wins and losses at this point in your life if you're older, but you remember the coaches who cared. You remember the relationships that were formed. Our text today, Hebrews 3, verse 13 The author of Hebrews implores his audience. This is the main imperative of the text. He says, Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The main thing the text tells us to do today is exhort one another. That's it. I could walk off the stage. That's the whole sermon. I'm going to unpack it, but that's really what's what's being said. And you and I, I don't need to convince you that there is plenty in the world today that can cause us to be discouraged. Many reasons for you and me today to feel discouraged as we enter 2023. There's countless forces that seek to tear us down. There's countless forces that seek to pull us away from the truth of the gospel to distract us and to draw our eyes off Jesus. Those forces are always at work. Like a good coach, we need to encourage one another. We need to care deeply for the people around us. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12 even talks about exhortation as a gift that he gives the church. There are certain people that are called and gifted to be exhorters. Sometimes a brother and a sister in Christ needs a kick in the pants, and sometimes they need a friendly arm on the shoulder. Sometimes a brother or sister in Christ needs a discipline, and sometimes they need to experience a little bit of grace, depending on the situation. Sometimes a brother or sister in Christ needs an encouraging word. Sometimes they need a loving rebuke. Sometimes a brother or sister in Christ needs space to consider Jesus, and sometimes they need to be engaged with the truth and the hope of the gospel by a friend who cares. All of this is exhortation. All of this is is encouragement. It's deeply relational. It all depends on you and I as the body of Christ knowing one another and knowing what it looks like to walk alongside one another. I'll say it again. Never stop encouraging one another. Never stop exhorting one another to confidently hold fast to Jesus. Now before I read our text in a whole, let me just kind of take a minute to reorient us to where we've been in Hebrews up to this point. 
We started this back in November. We are in the middle of of Hebrews chapter 3. From the beginning of chapter 3 and now all the way to the middle of chapter 10, we're going to be looking at the ways in which Jesus is superior to the law that Moses brought or the Mosaic law. And he's going to look at this from a variety of different ways. In the beginning part of chapter 3, we learned that Jesus is superior to Moses himself. And then over the next six and a half chapters, we're going to see as the author of Hebrews is going to elevate Jesus above the high priesthood. He's going to elevate Jesus and make sure that we know that he's clearly superior to the new covenant that we have in his blood versus the old covenant. And in chapters 9 and 10, we're going to see the superiority of Jesus' death to the sacrifices of the Mosaic law. He's, his blood is greater than the blood of goats and rams. Today we're in the middle of, of one of the warning passages. One of the threads that runs all the way through Hebrews are these warning passages. Jeremy introduced this a couple of weeks ago. In this warning passage, the, uh, the author is unpacking how Jesus is superior to Moses. And what he's been doing, if you can remember back to December 18th, Jeremy walked us through, the author is quoting Psalm 95. Now Psalm 95 was a psalm that was written about the, the, the rebellion of those Israelites who God delivered from Egypt. And the author is walking about that, talking about that generation of Jews who, who were miraculously delivered from captivity. E- even though these Jews witnessed the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and, and the presence of God in their midst in powerful ways, even though he used Moses to bring them from deliverance, he, he draws from Psalm 95 to highlight the disobedience of those wilderness wanderers. And he's using them as an example of who not to be in the present. So, in the middle of the warning, we pick up in verse, let's read 12 from last or from two weeks ago, then we'll read all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 19. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, he quotes Psalm 95 again, as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Verse 16. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now I know as we journey through Hebrews, the author is building on his argument, and sometimes it can feel like we're kind of reiterating things we've already covered. And there's certainly a bit of that today, and there will be a bit of that as we hit the warning passages through the end of the book. The author is warning again today and will continue to hear this language throughout the book of Hebrews about the uh, the hardening of hearts. He's warning against rebellion. He's saying that your rebellion will actually provoke God. He's warning against the deceitfulness of sin, against disobedience, and ultimately he's warning them about unbelief and the consequence of unbelief. The language is familiar, and yet as we read this passage, these few verses, there is something unique that this passage has to offer to the message of Hebrews as a whole. Even though there's a lot of reused language, reiterated language. There's something unique in this passage that we have not seen up to this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I met with the guys that I meet with on Thursdays to look at this text a few weeks ago, we were asking that question. So what is the unique contribution of Hebrews 3, 13 through 19 to the argument of Hebrews as a whole? And it was that one word, exhort. That's the unique contribution this text makes to the argument of Hebrews as a whole. This exhortation, it's an urging that is done by someone who comes alongside another. That word paraklesis or parakaleo, it's a Greek word which means to call to one side, to summon, to encourage, to admonish, to entreat. It's this word exhort or encourage. And so what that means is that that in the body of Christ, in the context of faith family, by, by all loving means necessary, within the context of personal knowledge of the other, we are to lean into one another's lives, to summon, to encourage, to admonish, to entreat one another, to cling to Jesus Christ. To hold fast to Jesus Christ, to take to take care that we do not let our hearts get hardened and fall away or drift away. This is the encouragement, and and, and the authors is telling us to exhort one another to that end. 
So here's what he's saying. He's saying that we should do this every day. Every day as long as it is called today. There is this here and now urgency in this call to exhort. That's why the sermon in a bottle today, my one phrase is never stop encouraging one another. That's the implication here. Every day, every single day, when you wake up every day, as long as it's called a day, we are to encourage. Never stop encouraging. Never stop exhorting one another to confidently hold fast to Jesus. Now we know the warnings up to this point. Chapter 2, verse 1, the author says, pay attention to what you've heard. Otherwise, you're going to drift from it. Chapter 3, verse 12, the first verse we read today, take care to not get an evil, unbelieving heart, lest you fall away from the living God. So our text today, he tells us how we can remain connected to Christ. He gives us a great tool as the church for how you and I can guard against spiritual drift or outright apostasy by falling away and rejecting the faith. We do this by never stopping in our exhortation every single day. That's why community is so vital. Never stop encouraging one another. Never stop exhorting one another to hold fast to Jesus. Now I could step off the stage. That's, the te- that's a sermon in a whole. But I think there's some unique things that the structure of the passage reveals to us that I think better informs what this looks like in our life. So here's the three points of the sermon. The first one is this. Encourage one another today. Verses 13 through 14. Encourage one another today. If you have the the app, there is a digital way to take notes. I would encourage you to do that because these are just important things for us to remember as we journey through this book. If you're a, a, a underlining or a highlighting type, underline or highlight the word exhort there in verse 13. It's not the the last time the author uses this word in Hebrews. He uses it two other times. If you go all the way to chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, we've got this very well known passage, and listen to how he uses the word exhort in this passage. Beginning in chapter 10, verse 24, the author says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That phrase, encouraging one another, is the same word that's used here in our text that's translated to exhort. It's just encouraging one another. It's just hopeful encouraging one another. Let us consider how to stir one another up. And notice how that takes place. Not neglecting to meet together. It revolves around community, around the people of God connecting. And then at the very end of Hebrews, the last verse before the benediction in chapter 13, verse 19, the author urges his audience. He says, I urge you. That's the word that's translated exhort in other places. I urge you the more earnestly to do this, which is pray for him, in order that I may restore you, be restored to you the sooner. So at the very end of his letter, the author is asking his audience to pray for him. He's praying for me because I want to come be with you. And, and what he does, he urges them. I mean, he says, I'm exhorting you to pray for me that I can come be with you. And so it's interesting that he's exhorting them to exhort him through prayer. And I couldn't help but notice as I was looking at this word that it appears in multiple other places in the New Testament. But a place that surprised me was in Matthew 5.4. In the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, as Jesus is giving the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That word comforted is the same word that's translated exhort in our text. So we begin to get this more robust understanding of what it means for us to exhort one another. It's to encourage one another. It's to urge one another. It's to comfort one another. It's to summon, to admonish, to entreat. We've got to remember that these were people who were weary. They were a tired people who were in much need of exhortation. Remember, Hebrews was written to a group of Christians who were in danger of giving up. There was many difficulties that were facing them. They were dealing with some serious questions about how their new Christian faith uh, related to their old religious practices. They were facing persecution from their fellow countrymen, from their family members, from the Roman government. And on top of all that, they were continuing to struggle with sin, habitual sin. Their conversion to Christ didn't forever cancel out their sin struggles. They they had much to be discouraged about. And they had much that they needed to be exhorted for. They were thinking about walking away from the faith. The author is writing these people to encourage them, to exhort them, to tell them that, yes, Christ is sufficient. He, He is saying that Christ is the very source of our encouragement. They needed to exhort one another with the truth of who Jesus was as well. 
And that's what the author is doing in a way. He's exampling for them what exhortation looks like to urge these people to never give up. And as we journey through Hebrews over the next several months, we're going to see again and again and again in different ways the the absolute perfection and the absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ. This is, this is the all-important truth that's over everything that the author is saying. The, he, Jesus is greater, truer, and better than everything else. He's absolutely perfect. He's absolutely sufficient. And once we can understand this, the author is telling the, the audience, them, then, and us today, once we understand the perfection and the sufficiency of Christ, the, the superiority of Christ, once we get that, and that, that truth res, resides in our hearts, we have all that we need as Christians. We have all that we need to remain faithful. We have all that we need to keep walking in faithfulness to how God wants us to walk. We have all that we need to persevere through the most backbreaking of circumstances. We are called to keep our faith anchored to the truth of the absolute perfection and absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ. And and just in the first three chapters, we've seen this language. If this is true of Christ, which it is, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider this Jesus. Hold fast to your confidence and to your boasting with hope. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be any of you with an unbelieving unbelieving, evil heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This is the argument that we've been sitting in for three and a half chapters or two and a half chapters. And so this is why it is so dangerous for us to deceive ourselves and believe that our faith can be lived out in isolation. And I I get it. I know there's a lot going on in the world today. There's careers. There's family. There's obligations. And I know how easy it is to have meeting together with the brothers and sisters in Christ kind of fall down the list of priority Staying fully engaged in the body of Christ becomes a secondary commitment or a secondary priority to to building career or our kids' athletic schedules or or hunting season or whatever it may be. Again, I'm not bashing. We we need days away, right? I'm not saying that we have to punch a time card when we come to church out of guilt. What I'm saying is it's more of a heart posture. Am I disengaging from the body? And am I, am I beginning to live as a lone ranger Christian, alone and in isolation? That is such a dangerous place to be because there's no exhortation in that place. People don't know what's going on in our lives. We don't know what's going on in their lives. And and by the way, it's not just that you and I need to be encouraged by staying engaged in the body. God has uniquely gifted you, called you, and positioned you to be an encourager to someone else and by self-selecting out. By disengaging from the body of Christ, you're depriving people who God has uniquely gifted you to encourage. We need one another. We we are to never stop encouraging one another. We are to never stop exhorting one another to confidently hold fast to Jesus. I need you, and you need me, and we need each other. It's a communal thing. It's a relational thing. So encourage one another today. Second thing we see in the text is the author is telling the audience, them then, and us today, to remember the rebellion of the wilderness generation. Verses 15 through 18. Notice all of the the language in these these four verses that call the reader to look back and to remember those Israelites who died in the desert. Look at verse 15. He he says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. What rebellion? That one that happened in the desert. That one. Verse 16. Who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? With whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And and whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest but to those who were disobedient? He's giving them a history lesson here. He's pointing them back to their ancestors. Why is it important that we know history? Right? You've heard this before, right? We we need to know history because we we tend to repeat history. It tends to repeat itself. And by knowing history, we we tend to prepare ourselves for what's to come. I try to tell this to my kids when when they tell me they hate social studies in school. I'm like, no, this is so important to know history because it tends to repeat itself. And, and, And the truly wise people, they learn from the mistakes of history and they avoid those mistakes in the present. So the author here, using... Again, re-quoting Psalm 95, he's telling his authors today, if he, or his audience, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. In other words, hear what I'm saying to you right now. 
today, please listen. Don't turn a deaf ear to God like those people did in your history. Don't be like them because it didn't end well for them. As you look to and as you remember the rebellion of those men and women, the wilderness generation, as you see the suffering and the, that their rebellion brought, learn from it. Today, please listen. Remember the rebellion of the wilderness generation and don't fall into the same trap. To belabor a, a metaphor, I go back to coaching. You know, this is the use of the film room. In coaching, you have a film room. Why? Well, because you go back after a game or a contest, and as a team, when I was in college, we got done playing football games. On Sunday after lunch, we would go back into the, the coach's office where we'd sit down, we'd watch film for hours. And he'd re rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind, play. And we would never look at what we did well. Not At least my coach didn't let us look at what we did well. But when you, when you messed up and it was caught on film, everyone got to see it. And you had to look at how you messed up. You had to look at your mistakes so you'd learn from them. And as my wife coaches track and field, she's an excellent track and field coach, you know, whether it's high jump or, or whether I was coaching sprinters, I would often, often film these kids in practice because there's so much technique and fundamentals involved in coming out of starting blocks or, or high jumping over a bar. And so with iPads, it's incredible. You just film real time and they come back and you go on slow motion. You help them watch every little nano bit. Oh, your foot was, wasn't right here. And you started arching your back a little too quick. Or, or you lifted your head when you came out of the blocks. Or, or your knees are bent a little bit beyond 90. And you begin to see what didn't go well so that you can do it right the next time. This is the idea here. Look at how they failed and just don't be like your ancestors. The big idea again and again that comes up is in, in, in pointing them back to the failures of the wilderness generation, the author is exhorting and encouraging them to remain faithful. He, he's, he's telling his audience and them then and us today that we must also never stop encouraging one another. We, we must never stop exhorting one another to confidently hold fast to Jesus. And this takes us to our final point. The final point, after we're, we're, we're called to encourage one another today, after the author tells them to remember the rebellion of the wilderness generation, looking finally at verse 19, the author says, see the consequence of unbelief. See the consequence of unbelief. He begins verse 19 by saying, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. If you're a highlighter or an underliner, circle that phrase, so we see. After asking five questions in three verses, the author is telling his audience, both them then, and us today, he's telling them of the, of the history of these, of these hard-hearted, unbelieving, disobedient wilderness wanderers. He's telling them that story that they might see the consequence of unbelief and be warned by it today. It seems as if the author sums up all of the language. He's used some harsh language throughout chapter 3 to refer to the wilderness generation. And it seems that he sums up all of that language into one root reality that caused it all. It's the final word of our text today. Unbelief. The failures of the wilderness generation, their hardened hearts, their rebellion which provoked God, the deceitfulness of their sin, their disobedience was all a fruit of unbelief. It's all summed up here in that word. The author wants us, as a cautionary tale, to see their unbelief to see the consequence of their unbelief. Their bodies fell in the wilderness. They died in rebellion. They had 40 years to repent and get it right, and they didn't. And they died in rebellion. But today, as long as it's today, every day, we must exhort one another to not be like them. They did not enter God's rest. In fact, they were unable to enter it, we read at the very end of our passage. <clears throat> so here's the argument. Here's what the author is saying. He's saying, look at that wilderness generation. Look at them. And we know the story. You've watched Prince of Egypt. You've read this story in Sunday school. You know the story. A captive people who were groaning. God heard their cries. God heard their moans. God heard their groans. And he came to rescue them. He sent to deliver Moses. And miraculously, he delivered them. And they refused to respond to his power and his promise they walked away from the promised land and they died in the wilderness. So here is, here's the argument. He's saying that those men in that wilderness generation, those men and women, they experienced a miraculous deliverance at the hands of God. They received a covenant promise from God. 
They saw his power at work real time in their midst. <clears throat> and yet, they disbelieved in the promise and the power of God. They missed out on the promised rest of the promised land. They died in disobedience in the desert, a restless wandering their fate. His message to the original audience then and us today is this. He's saying, you too, Christian, you too have experienced a miraculous deliverance at the hands of God. And in fact, it's a greater deliverance, not just a deliverance from human oppressors, but a deliverance from sin and death itself through Christ. You too have received a covenant promise from God. It's a better covenant sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You too have seen the power of God at play in your very midst. Not only did the body of Christ get resurrected, but God has made dead men and women, you and I who are dead in our trespasses and our sins, he has made us alive together with him. That's miraculous. You've seen all of it. Don't be like the disbelieving wilderness generation. This is his warning. They doubted in the promise and in the power of God. Don't be like the disbelieving wilderness generation who missed out on the promised rest of the promised land. You stand to miss out on a much greater rest. Not just the rest of the promised land, but the rest of the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth, eternity with Christ, his kingdom forever. Don't be like those from the wilderness generation who died in disobedience in the desert. Their fate was a restless wandering. That's why he's got these warnings laced throughout this letter. It's, it's a warning spoken in love to people he loves. You have much to lose, so don't drift from it. Don't fall away. Take care to not harden your heart. Hold fast. Hold firm to Jesus. Anchor your life. Anchor your hope in him. He is perfect and he is sufficient. Man, as I think about this text, as I think about the fear and the horror of men and women walking away from Jesus, it's so unsettling to me. It's so unsettling to me. As I see men and women over the course of 20 plus years in ministry, and as I survey the landscape of the Christian world, I see real life examples of, of apostasy. Apostasy simply means an abandonment or renunciation of Christ. I see it. It's devastating. Jeremy and I have been talking about this. It's unsettling. It's so difficult to see this happen. It happens. And I just spent 12 days back in Wapaka, Wisconsin, this little community I lived in. And I was a pastor there the whole time I lived there. Um, a youth pastor and a senior pastor of, of a church there. And I, and I went, when I first got to Wapaka, I, I went to the friend, uh, the house of an old friend who I did ministry with for years. And, and we just got to talking about people that we knew, that we loved, that we pastored and shepherded. And not copious amounts of people, but certainly an unsettling amount of people who I baptized, who had a credible confession of faith from my perspective, who seemed to have walked with Jesus for a season, have not only drifted, but have, many of them have outright fallen away and, and deny Christ openly now. Oh, hearing those stories was devastating. It was, it was terrifying. Because I think of that wilderness generation that died in rebellion apart from God, and I think of these people whom I love who are going to die in rebellion apart from God, and it's awful. It was awful. But then, you know, as I was letting that, those horrific stories just really settled deeply into my heart. On Christmas Eve morning, I got up and I had to run into this town I used to live in, and I went to this restaurant I used to frequent all the time to get a gift card for my parents. By the way, if you ever go eat at a restaurant in Wisconsin, they don't gauge the quality of a restaurant based on the quality of the food, but the quantity. So it doesn't matter if it tastes like air. If there's a bunch of it, it's a great restaurant. You order one egg, you get five. Anyways, that's a side note. I go to this restaurant and I'm buying a gift card and this young lady who is very familiar to me and I'm trying to place her, she's probably 34, 35 or something. She's like, are you still a pastor? I'm like, ah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a pastor in Oregon. I'm like, ah, she said, I'm so sorry. Remind me of your name. She's like, oh, I'm Alicia. I remember I used to go to a youth group back when you lived in Wapaka. And she's like, it was the highlight of my high school life. It, like, it, it just kept me alive. I gave her a hug and, and, and went away and I thought, oh God, thank you. Thank you. All, all those, you know, as a dumb, stupid youth pastor that I was back in the day, you know, the, the, trying my best to, to exhort and encourage these high school kids, there, there were some seeds that settled in this young lady's heart. And then I went and I worshipped this church I used to pastor many years ago, and the same church, and, and I went to Christmas Eve service, which was wonderful with my family, and, and I got to talk to dozens and dozens of people who talked about the faithfulness of God and how somehow, someway, through my flawed and broken and awful preaching and awful ministry, somehow they met Christ through it. 
And, and my, my, my faithfulness was, was used as an, ex, an exhortation or an encouragement to their faith. It, it, it allowed me to see the bigness of God, that he works through us still. And, and there's people who are still walking with Jesus because of the ministry that God allowed me to be a part of back in those days. <clears throat> and then I got this totally unsolicited, out of the blue Facebook message from a kid I used to coach before I was a pastor, 25 years ago. Quarterback, Nate. And I get this unsolicited message from him like three days ago saying, Coach, I'd follow you into the fire. I'd follow you anywhere. Do you have any openings to, to disciple me from afar? And I thought, God, you knew exactly what my heart needed. <laughs> I was so heartbroken over these stories of apostasy that had taken place with people I love. But then I'm reminded, like, those, those hours, those days, those, those, those prayers, those encouragements, those rebukes, all those years of walking alongside these men and women, God used it. It wasn't because of me. I was just a vessel, but God used it. It matters. It matters when we exhort one another. It's not empty words. It's not flattery. It, it sometimes is a lifeline to men and women who are hanging on by a thread when a brother or sister in Christ has the courage or the love or, or the wherewithal to step outside of themselves, step into the life of another person and speak a word of exhortation. It might be a rebuke. It might be a praise. It might be a kick in the butt. It might be an arm around the shoulder. It might be a word of correction. It might be a moment of grace. But as long as we step into each other's lives in the name of Jesus to point one another to Christ, that we might not die in disobedience. We are to exhort one another. What a beautiful example. You and I, we need to be encouraged. We can't do this life alone. You and I, we need to be an encourager. Those to our left and those to our right and those in front of us and those behind us cannot do this life alone. God has made us to be interdependent to encourage one another. Never stop encouraging one another. Never stop exhorting one another. Confidently, let's, 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 let's call one another to hold fast to Jesus. The consequence of unbelief is very real. So church, as, as you remember the rebellion of the wilderness generation, as you see the consequence of unbelief, may you and I be wholly and fully committed to encouraging one another. You know, I was able to go on this little trip to, uh, to, to Wisconsin, and it was just a blessing. I'm grateful to the staff to, to, to go through Christmas Eve without my helping hand, and I missed last two Sundays I was gone. Two, two times we gathered to worship, I was gone. But it was important that I go be with my family. <clears throat> as many of you know, I get asked every Sunday, how's your mom doing? You know that my mother has been fighting cancer for a couple of years. And her, her battle, is it's a fierce battle right now. She goes into another round of chemo and radiation here this next month, and actually this month in January. And me and my, my siblings felt it quite important that we spend Christmas together with my mom, not real sure of, of how much time we have. And so we went out there with this idea that we were going to encourage my mom and dad, and we were going to you know, sort of exhort them. My whole family knows, has faith in Christ. All my siblings, my parents were all believers. And, and we went out there, and it was just so sweet. It was such a precious time. Some of you have commented that you, you've been able to follow some of the things I've put on Facebook, just sharing that story. But, you know, as we gathered around the table, as we reminisced and shared stories, as we laughed and, and told embarrassing stories about the past, um, I realized that it wasn't just my mom and dad who needed exhortation. It was all of us. And there was this beautiful thing that happened around the table as we exhorted one another and encouraged one another, as we shared Scripture and talked about the Gospel and spent time in praying together. It was beautiful. And it was this picture of exhortation lived out in a small community. And thank God my faith family is also my biological family. And the conversation was not about cancer, but about Christ. Not about death, but about life. That exhortation was life to me. What does exhortation look like in your life and in my life? On a very practical level, where does the rubber meet the road when it comes to this? In our, in our family, in our marriages, if you're married, in our families, our family units, in our, in our Christian community, in our church broadly, what does exhortation look like in your life and in my life? And I just want to share, share three very practical points of application. Here's three things that must be true if exhortation is going to be true of us. Number one, we need to seek godliness in our own lives. We need to seek godliness in our own lives. We need to engage with God. We need to dig a deep well that comes from continually meeting with God 
to withdrawing to a quiet place to pray, to meeting with him in the word, to, commit, to, to, to deep spiritual growth and transformation, to engaging in the life of discipleship, that the image of, of God may be shaped and formed in us, that we may begin to look more like Jesus so that we can love people like, like Jesus loved people. So it begins with a commitment in our own lives to seek godliness. And then we've got to show up in the lives of others. I mean, you've seen all these videos. Maybe you have not, but, but am I... These videos I've seen pop up on social media are these images of little kids at Christmas. These little five-year-old kids get up on the stage and they're at their, their school concert. There's a thousand parents in the audience and these little kids are looking and looking and looking and looking and looking and their mom and dad is filming with an iPhone somewhere in the back and they look and they lock eyes with their parents. And they go... <laughs> and you see the value of showing up. We've got to show up in each other's lives. We've got to show up on, on the beautiful days and we've got to show up on the not-so-beautiful days. I shared on Facebook a while ago this, this quote by Henry Nouwen where he talks about the, the root of the word care is the Gothic uh, kara, which means to lament. The basic meaning of care, to step into one another's lives on those worst days, the basic meaning of care is to grieve, to experience sorrow, and to cry out with the other. We're called to encourage one another, to show up in the lives of one another, to engage with the body. And then, in addition to showing up, then we have to go to that third piece, which is to share the truth in love. If we are walking with God, we're growing in godliness, we're meeting with Him in His Word, we're pursuing mature doctrine, we're pursuing a, a deep understanding of the gospel, we have some valuable truth that we can share with one another. And sometimes those words are a word of rebuke, for a brother and sister who's going astray, they're wandering in the desert. And sometimes that word is, is a word of just absolute encouragement to say, you know what, I watch you parent your kids, or I watch you walk with the Lord, or I watch you serve at church, and it ministers to my soul. God is using you, brother. God is using you, sister. Keep it up. Imagine the life that that would breathe in the congregation if we just lived that sort of exhorting life with one another having the courage to speak rebuke when necessary and having the presence of mind to speak encouraging and life-giving words when appropriate. And so I'll close, but I want to close simply just with, with one question that I want you to consider today. And I, I'm not trying to be cute. I seriously want you to think about this for a second. Who needs you? If the implication of this passage today is that we are to exhort one another, that we're made and we're meant to be interdependent where we need the exhortation from our brothers and sisters in Christ to guard against drift, to guard against falling away. Who needs you? Who, whose life has God put you in that needs a loving exhortation? Might be a kid, a child, might be a spouse, might be a parent, might be a family member, might be a brother or sister in Christ here at Heritage, might be a brother or sister who's not at Heritage, but you know they're struggling. I just want to encourage you to ask God to, to move in your heart and mind, to lift your eyes, to see the people in your life who God has called you, equipped you, gifted you, and positioned you to speak a word of exhortation over. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for the privilege you give us today of gathering in this place. God, the privilege you give us of opening up your word week in and week out, God, of learning from your word. I pray, God, that as we consider the the implication of our passage today, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see the things we need to see and, and soften the hearts to respond to, to these truths the way you would call us to. God, help us to understand what it means that we are to never stop exhorting one another to confidently hold fast to Jesus. God, give us eyes to see the people in our life who you have positioned us to exhort. God, help us to not live isolated lives. God, help break down those barriers, those fears that we have about authentic relationship marked by love. God, help us break down those barriers that have kept us up to this point from being fully engaged in the body and being present to be an encourager to others. God, would you just move in our lives, give us a vision for the kind of a biblical and Christian community you've called us to, God. And would we be a church, God, would you work in our midst so that we might be a church here at Heritage Christian Fellowship that boldly and joyously and continually exhorts one another. God, that we would exhort one another to hold fast to your son Jesus, to hold firm to the truth of the gospel. God, to walk in newness of life, 
to grow, to be molded, to be shaped individually and collectively into the image of your son. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.